Hello and welcome. Today I am joined by Andy Stanbury, who is a soft tissue therapist. So Andy, thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks Andy for having me. Yeah, good to be here. So I didn't list all of the places that you've done and all the things that you've done because it's extensive. So we can dig into that as we, as we go now. But where are you talking from today? So uh, currently I'm, I'm working in private practice with a, uh, a small outfit in uh, Reading in Berkshire called One Physiotherapy. So uh, I've been here now with them since July um, and we basically have a, um, a sort of four clinics if you will um two of which are accessible by for the general public and then we provide um physiotherapy services to a private school near us um for their staff and students and then a corporate um uh, offering to um a company again based in reading where uh, we're fortunate to have access to a gym space and a treatment room to to look after their employees which is where you find me today <clears throat> Right. So is that would you class that as occupational health then or is it on the physio side still or rehab? No, it's very much still on the physiotherapy side. Um, so out of this sort of corporate uh, facility, we provide both soft tissue therapy for myself um, and physiotherapy. Um, but like a lot of corporate facilities um, and organisations, many of the employees dip into sports at various levels you know the weekend warriors through to just your your general health stuff um, um so it crosses over with treating those that have a purpose so I, I you know as an example i have a a patient who's um a master swimmer um and an engineer at the company he works for so a lot of what i do with him is actually almost like when i used to work in performance sport it's taking that knowledge and that understanding and helping him with with that and education um and you know treating him in the, the same way to offload you know training volume issues um help with recovery any sort of specifics that he need that he's that he's got that he wants to work on um and then uh, help him with getting race ready really so um i think again as off the back of him being a really active um person um he's then doesn't have the same occupational problems from being sedentary because you know a lot of the time and stuff so with at the opposite end of the scale we do you know there's patients that come through that you know are very much desk based and and don't necessarily have a lot of uh, a lot of activity in their daily uh, lifestyle and stuff so um yeah it varies it varies um hugely um as anyone who works in private practice will find you know it's um it's a very broad spectrum of of, of patient demographic really so I guess the company that, that you do that for, that they're just doing that as a staff incentive to that it's, it's helpful for that particular guy, but also the not completely altruistic because they get people that are fit and able to, to come to work, I guess, as well. Yeah, very much so. Um, I mean, it's a very large it's a very large company and they have their own running clubs, they have their own cycling clubs. Um, uh, they even have a cricket team, you know, so um, I think it's almost like it reminds me a little bit of my my dad when he used to work in in a big corporate um uh, uh business you know that had the social club and that had the you know the cricket teams the football teams you know it was very much um i think back in in those days your your activity levels were based around your work you know there wasn't the access to sports clubs and things that there are today um and so uh so yeah it's a little bit it's a little bit like that i guess really um and um it's an american company so um with ties to to the middle east as well so yeah it's it's got a lot of um facets to it that um that make it interesting you know so uh, we also see lots of different um people from different cultures and the, you know that equally uh um affects sort of what their beliefs are what they're used to you know and that probably ties into a little bit with sports and working with teams where you've got multicultural athletes you know namely probably football and, and rugby and stuff where you know uh how they perceive and how they use sports massage and soft tissue and what physio is will be very different you know from one country to the next and stuff so it's interesting it's interesting and um you know trying to kind of um articulate you know what it is here and how it works and how i guess we believe um 
best practice operates at, at, at that level, um, how that sort of operates really. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I was at a massive, massive manufacturer, car manufacturer yesterday at one of their factories and they've got the the, um, the the physio who works there, she was showing me around the facilities, really impressive. They've got amazing gym in there, sauna, steam room, got golf simulator. They put on yoga, Pilates, all of these things, podiatry, which I think is will be very new to that kind of mm. blue collar area. Um, mm. But it's really interesting to see what value they put in there, which makes sense again, because it gets people, keeps people active, um, keeps people engaged, keeps people wanting to come to, to work as well. Mm. So it is interesting how that occupational health space or these companies seeing the value in in keeping their staff physically fit and mentally fit, I guess, as well. I mean, it makes sense, but it's still a relatively really? new concept. Yeah, and I think it's um, it's a huge benefit and a huge incentives for for employees across any um, any business. Really, is that the there's a huge push in that kind of health and well-being space, you know, and and what is offered underneath that and stuff. So, you know, I think you're even with a lot of um, sort of WeWork type spaces, um, you're starting to see that they're putting gyms in there and they're starting to put changing facilities and there's there's other things for, for that because they recognise that I think probably the way people work now off the back of COVID is that they're not strapped to their desk nine to five and that they fit it in around that. There is a lot more I guess freedom to give people the accountability to go off and do something in the middle of the day and you know um or come in later and do that you know um before they start work and stuff um after dropping the kids off as opposed to like i've got to get to the gym early (laughs) you know get home get the kids get them to get them into school and stuff so there's a lot more flexibility i think with that these days because people have been able to prove through working from home through covid that they can still be productive and still um, do their job effectively. Um, so there's a little bit more leniency, I would say, with that. And certainly those smaller outfits that that have kind of reduced their costs by not having an office space that's theirs anymore, that allow their people to work from remote sites and things like that, is still having those facilities available and stuff. So with that, you're certainly seeing a lot more of that in the uh, um, in the general public space these days, um, which is great to see. Yeah, no, definitely. We're, we're based in a WeWork in Manchester and I, mm. I love the concept of communal workspaces. But I, I think it's a great idea that we, they used to put on free massage in there. Um, mm. They've kind of they've stopped that for now since COVID. But I just think all of that stuff is great because it really does get people into the office. People want to go to work. It doesn't actually feel like a work environment in, in, in WeWork spaces. Um, mm. But then from the physical aspect, it really makes sense to have to have a whether it's a gym or rehab centre, whatever you want to call it, I think it's yeah. it's a real good benefit for for well, for people in general. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we went off on a tangent there, but it's interesting anyway. <laughs> we'll probably come full circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Thanks for that. That was, that was interesting to to find out where you're working on. So, whereabouts are you from originally? So, um, so my my home is actually a, a Berkshire. So I I live. Uh, about half an hour drive from from Reading. Um, born in Reading, sort of lived sort of Newbury area um, most of my life, really, uh, apart from my time doing a, a degree when I was down in Cardiff. Um, and I guess really I've been fortunate that um, most of the, the the opportunities I've had to to work in, in in sport and private practice have always been commutable from home. Um, some a little further and a little more challenging than others which we'll, we'll come to i'm sure uh, 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 later on but um yeah i mean it, it's um that's that's sort of where where home has always been really Fam- families around there as well so um so yeah i've been fortunate in that respect yeah no it's a nice nice part of the world around that area so then when you were growing up then so did you did you have an idea that you wanted to go into this this area not really. I think it shifted uh, when I was at university. I, I, funnily enough, my my initial interest was in art and design. Um, I actually I did my uh, after I did my GCSEs. I went. I stayed on at school and did um, a GMVQ in uh, in art and design. Um, was actually looking to go off to university to do a foundation art degree, um, combining it potentially with physical education. Um, with a thought of maybe teaching at the end of it, you know, and having sort of two teaching subjects. And um, 
I got to uh, to a university open day and sort of looked at the level of uh, artwork around the walls and I thought I'm not sure about this I'm a, I, I would I've, I'm a way off where I need to be I think and I kind of went away and sort of thought mm, you know I, I, I'm not sure I can I guess I question my abilities really in terms of do I think you know I could I could get to the to where I needed to be to kind of then go on to the degree program really and I, I thought mm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure and I looked at what else I could do and I still had maintained that interest in the in the sports side because I'd always been around sport every sport I enjoyed you know I was very active as a um, when I was younger and football and tennis really were my two sort of main sports and um, so I then made the decision to go to college and did another GMVQ but in leisure and tourism this time and it was it was kind of split where you had the tourism on one side and then you had the leisure and sport on the other. So I obviously went down the leisure and sport route. Um, two years doing that, we uh, sort of looked at the university options again and um, decided to go to UIC as it was then, uh, Cardiff Met as it is now, um, to do sport and physical education. Again, with a, a thought of going on and doing a PGC at the end of it and PE teaching. And um, I got into my second year did a sports injuries module and pivoted again and just thought, mm, you know, this is really interesting. What, what, what can I do that's related to this? And I think, you know, at the time, so I was at uni from 98 till 2001, that there wasn't, you know, the sports therapy, sports rehab degrees to the, to the volume that there are now. And um, it was only really physiotherapy um that was you know an option um within a full-time education and i'd i'd got to a point where i was i just need to go out and work i need to get some experience and i, I didn't really have the appetite to then do another two years full-time so i came across sport and remedial massage therapy and it was i guess it was relatively niche to the general public at that time it was very much only sports teams and that that really sort of had had access to to the the level that um it probably is now still to the general public but um i thought well i could do this i could work and i could do it part-time and stuff so that's what i did i came I, I came out of uni um worked in a in a health center for a year with doing sort of organizing kids activities and coaching and all of that lifeguarding, a bit of jack of all trades, really worked in the gym. And um, whilst then also doing my uh, qualifications in level four in sport and remedial massage therapy, as it was then. So level five didn't, didn't exist, which is kind of like where most people can access now. I think a lot of degree programs are either level four or level five. So, um, so that was, that was really the start of my journey. And uh, I qualified with that in May, 2003. Um, and, uh, then thought, what now? <laughs> so, um, so I, I sort of went into, as a lot of people do, looked at the option of private uh, practice um, and just getting some experience and some. Uh, and I was fortunate; the health club that I worked at had a a space, like a, I guess a health and beauty space, really, that you could rent rooms from. So, I started there. Um, but my intention was always to try and get into sport in some capacity, um, ideally football. Um, and it just so happened a good friend of mine um, was playing full time for uh, Woking Football Club um, in National League. Um, and he uh, he had a chat with the physio and said, that, you know, would, would I be able to go in and, and just help out and get some experience and stuff? And. I basically stayed there for a year working voluntary with with Woking, supporting the physio, going in a couple of couple of days a week, plus then doing my other job around it and then doing weekends as well with the games and stuff. So it was pretty full on. But, you know, it's a, a massive opportunity to get uh, um, experience under my belt in a in a sporting environment. Um, which I think was the catalyst to to sort of moving on from there into sport full time and, you know, on the journey it's taken me really. So then just going back to the art bit as well then, so was there any, when you were doing the, the degree course, mm. did you ever think I'm in the wrong bit or was it as soon as you got to that injury module you thought actually no this is this has been a great decision I can see, I can see a future in it? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I ever felt I was in the wrong place. I think, you know, it certainly broadened my horizons in terms of where you could go with it. Um, and, um, you know, we part one of the modules was um, analytics and, you know, what it is today as, as, as a, you know, an analyst and, data, you know, data scientists and, you know, um, tracking games and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, there was that space and, you know, a good, good friend of mine at university has gone on to, to sort of develop um, the 21st club, um, w which is very big in, in analytics and particularly in football and stuff. And um, I think it was on the, at the time as well when ProZone was kind of launched uh, as well. So um, there was always that avenue, which was really interesting. Um, and funnily, I sort of came back into that a little bit um, with my time at Reading. Um, but it was always the sports, the sports injury stuff. I just found, you know, uh, learning about anatomy and physiology. And I wasn't a scientist, you know, I, I wasn't ever going to go down the, the, the sport and science science route and, you know, physiology and that kind of stuff. I, I, I guess I was, I guess maybe my art background and, and that kind of, um, uh, that approach to working, kind of fits with soft tissue therapy you know there's a science and an art to it you know and and it's um and i think there is the you using your hands to kind of affect change is, is is essentially what you're doing on a bit of canvas or a bit of paper with a, a paintbrush or you know a pencil or charcoal or whatever so yeah maybe maybe it's it's kind of similar but different i don't know um uh, i'll, I'll, I'll let, let, let other people decide on on, on where where that sits but um and it, to be honest, I mean, I, I I haven't probably picked up a, a pen or a pencil to sort of do any any drawing since, really. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think from that, I probably made the right decision, you know. So. So, yeah. Yeah, no, sounds like it. And then you mentioned Woking. I don't know if you mm. remember this because this just randomly came into my head. Do you remember a guy called Tim Bazaglo? No, I don't know. No, really random. I won't bore anyone else with it. But <laughs> I think I just remember. I think he scored. I think he scored a hat trick. It was like I think it was in the eighties even, because yeah. we must be a similar age. But I remember he scored. They knocked someone out in the FA Cup. I can't remember who it was, but I think he scored a hat trick. Yeah, I'll um, I'll search that later on, but I won't I won't pursue that one. No, I was um I was there when Glenn Cockrell uh was was manager. So um former sort of Southampton legend i guess um so he was managing at the time but there was a number of of, of players that played at the highest level ian selly who was ex-arsenal and i think won the uh, the um european cup winners cup with arsenal under george graham and um yeah there was um a, a good a good group of lads there actually um from various backgrounds that had either come up from the lower leagues or come down and sort of towards the end of their career and stuff but there was a good a good spirit around the club at, at, at the time and um um so yeah it, it was a, it was a great time to kind of just go in and, and get some experience really so uh you know valued it hugely yeah and how long were you there for um i probably say i was there for a, for a full season and then probably a bit, bit part into into the sort of 2000 and so i was there 2003 2004 and then probably a bit part for the first half of the 2004 5 season because um off the back of uh, of that experience I gained at Woking, um, I I got a, a part time role with Reading Football Club, um, and um, that was very much sort of started off a couple of days a week going in to work around sort of pre and post training, and also to travel with the team for for match days and stuff. Um, so. Uh, so that was just, you know, a huge jump, obviously, going from from a national league level to championship level and, you know, the the requirements uh, and the needs, I guess, of the, the players based on their sort of the training intensity and the training volume. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to kind of then work under the, you know, under John Fern, who I know you spoke to uh, a few weeks back and stuff. And, um, you know, it was a massive learning curve for me, really. And, and I learned a lot you know from him um and from the team that that um that he had around him in terms of that support and um i ended up being at reading till about five and a half seasons i think it was so um and very much under steve Copple's reign really and uh um it was um yeah it was a, a 
phenomenal journey as you you probably know all about now from from speaking to John and stuff and it was a great great time for the club and um you know I I, I guess I started off in a part-time role but when I finished it was very much a full-time role and you know I like to think that um that we'd sort of taken the service from being very much you know your masseur or masseuse type role to actually you know a sort of a, a clinical sports massage therapist soft tissue therapist and you know I had um Dan Buchanan who you may know um came in um to replace me when I left to go to the English Institute of Sport and kicked it on even further and and took it to sort of another level really so I'd like to think that you know between the two of us we were sort of a, a catalyst to kind of moving the sort of the old school approach to rubs and things like that to more of a you know an advanced level of thinking and uh, critical thinking and application of soft tissue therapy techniques you know to improve performance and recovery really um as part of a wider medical setup you know so um but it was during that time i also got to uh as i've alluded to already dip back into a bit of analysis stuff so i was sort of part-time part-time massage therapist and part-time analyst really um so i was sports coding and massaging a keyboard and then i was um massaging players so uh you know it was it was pretty full-on trying to do those two roles and it, it it was during the season that we also got promoted to the premier league so uh so yeah it was a, an exciting time and um it certainly helped me understand another side to to the game which as we know has exploded quite a lot um over recent years um and um but it helped me sort of later on when i came back into the game to understand how we could use that uh effectively um to treat the players and stuff in terms of the data that was collected and training volume and stuff like that so uh so yeah i'll talk about a bit that a bit more sort of a bit later on i guess but so is that that then that data collection but mm. what what sort of information was that that you were gathering? It was very much clipping. It was games. It was you know coding the games um, and um, clipping them into files to be able to show back to the management team and to go through the players. You know um, we used to do defensive uh, stuff. Um, so Friday nights um, a game or after training on a Friday, you know we'd go through that stuff with the defensive unit um there were sort of goals but also um uh, the manager would very much look after the opposition um and pull that stuff together and then i'd sort of look after you know the uh, uh, the reading team um and sort of putting together um motivational sort of uh cds and things to play on the on the bus on the way to a game and stuff which was always always good fun um so so yeah it was uh it was very much thrown in at the deep end i think uh i, I kind of had a, a fast track to using sports code when the players are away on pre-season tour and then it sort of really started off from there really um so uh yeah and then it was the role really became once we went into the premier league it was very much you needed someone full-time on that and very much someone full time on the the massage therapy side. So I was sort of picking up the reserve stuff as well as the first team. You know, we brought start to bring in a couple of people to help out on recovery days and things um, uh, with it. With you know, to 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 help them get their experience in the same way that I did when I when I was at Woking, and um, uh, and then that's when sort of Prozone really sort of came in and worked with us um, for the analysis stuff. Um, and it sort of went from there, really. So, yeah. What, what would a motivational CD look like then? <laughs> um, lots of crosses, lots of goals, lots of um, lots of good tackles, um, some good music um, that blended to everyone's ears. Um, I think we had quite a variety in terms of what motivated people. Our goalkeeper at the time was... Marcus Hanneman, who was um, American and very much um, when he wasn't, you know, on a football pitch, he was pulling apart his car and then building it again. And, you know, he was um, uh, used to turn up in uh, snakeskin cowboy boots and uh, he was not your typical footballer that you see today. That's for sure. You know, and uh, so uh, he was very much um, slipknot and hit all sorts of heavy metal and, you know, stuff that, um, you know, is considered uh 
uh, torture for some, I would guess. And uh, but um, yeah, it was uh, it was always good fun trying to map map songs that you think were going to motivate people and, uh, and 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 get some clips on there. And you know, you use the media team to find anything that was a little bit kind of funny as well uh, uh, to dig out and add that in as well, which always brought a bit of a laugh. But but we we um we had a really strong unit um, during that time. Very small support staff um, team, uh, nothing like it is today. Um, but, um, you know, we all got on really well. Um, and uh, I think we just all, you know, a lot of um, a lot of it was, you know, we respected each other's roles, uh, respected each other's um, experiences. Um, we just um, and we valued each other's um views on things and it was very much an open environment uh there wasn't really a, a hierarchy as such you know obviously john um was accountable for a lot of it but certainly um he was um great at facilitating an environment where everyone sort of could share their views and you know and um it was great you know we all sort of shared um within the rehab side of things and looked after players and then sort of brought that all back together and stuff so it was it was great uh, it was a great time and say so it was um we're, we're watching closely what Burnley are doing at the moment because we still hold on to the 106 point record um although they're pushing this a little bit this season but um they didn't have a 20 30 million pound parachute payment uh that Burnley have had uh so I, uh, I will stand by the fact and many will that what we did it with versus what they might do it with is very different so yeah, that's getting in early. I like that. Getting in before yeah. they've even done it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you mentioned like about your role changing and you probably mm. were in the earlier side of that. So when you went in under John then, did, mm. did, did, did do you think he saw that that would be the case, that your role would become more integral and you'd be get more involved in other areas? Was that talked about in the interview? Um, not Not really. I think, again, it comes back to what I was just saying about respecting sort of experiences and and um i think what um i think john just gave me the freedom to to be able to drive it forwards as uh, as i felt appropriate really you know um i was certainly hungry to learn i was uh, i was hungry to kind of want to do more um and uh, to make it better i i think you know at the time, there was, and, and to a degree in football now, I think there is this perception of what sports massage is, um, and um, versus what it can be, you know, and it can sometimes be um, looked upon in a in a slightly different way about what it can do, um, and you know, and again, that's very much based on you know different experiences at different clubs and things, but. Um, you know, I think John was very much like I knew I know what we've had, um, but um, he was in the same way that he was driven and was wanting to kind of make, you know, the department as, as, as good as it could be within the budget that it had. You know, he very much was pushing everyone else in that direction as well. And, um, you know, I'd like to think that through that freedom to do that and that curiosity to go and learn from others and what, um, you know, both in football, but then outside of football and bringing that back in, it sort of really organically evolved um, into, into doing that, you know, and you know, I think a lot, lot, a lot um, must be said of the players that allow that as well. Cause you know, as we all know, athletes are very particular about what they want and what they have, um, particularly when it's around competition and there is very much a, I guess a psychological component to it in terms of you're actually you're actually delivering based on routines and uh, as much as you are about trying to influence physiological changes and things like that so it's about you know those then it becomes about education and learning a lot about yourself about how you communicate with with different players and stuff and we, we didn't really have an abundance of foreign players then like you do at clubs now you know so the la the language barrier wasn't necessarily an issue and stuff but you know i imagine that adds another challenge these days as well which is why you see a, multi a sort of a, a multicultural and diverse um uh backroom staff really and medical team so to allow for that but um yeah i think it, it just evolved into into um that trust of 
not just treating players that are not injured, but the confidence that John had in myself and then Dan subsequently that, um, you know, we've got this player who's at this stage of healing. We need this to be worked on and go away and do it. And, and that trust that you weren't going to um, do any further damage or you weren't going to uh, compromise that kind of healing process and stuff. And once you kind of started to show that you could uh, affect change with that in a positive way, then more of that started to come your way. So it's very much about kind of um, communication, um, you know, building that trust, building that rapport, um, having confidence in what you, you, you do and what you can do, um, but equally being um, humble enough to keep asking questions, you know, with those that are more experienced around you and stuff. And, um, you know, you, you never really start learning until you start doing a job. You know, the, the, I think the education that you goes before it just kind of gives you the framework, you know, it's you to, it's for you to go out there and build on that and fill the gaps, which is often a lot of the soft skills and how you relate to people and stuff, you know, and I think that's, that was, I think, fundamentally where it changed. It was a certainly very much more an organic kind of thing, really, than it was, um, you know, purposeful, I would say. Um, or it's purposeful, but it wasn't at the forefront. It was kind of there, sort of in the background, really. Yeah, I think the soft skills bit's interesting. Did you see that as being something that was going to be as important when you first went in there? Or could, did you see that developing? And we we'll probably still still do see that development of how important those things are yeah i mean i don't think you ever really kind of you don't ever really learn that on a degree program or you know even you know a, a, a postgrad program or or any sort of um qualification and things i think you, you you're made to understand um that it's important but actually digging down on what that looks like and what it should feel like um doesn't really kind of get explored too much or it certainly didn't when when i was uh studying in that um and i guess it's something that you kind of got to be how do i put it your ability to self-reflect and to be able to step away from the situation and go you know what was my what was my approach what was my behaviors you know how was i feeling at you know almost assess yourself in that situation and then like all uh, and then be able to then go back into something similar and change your approach um and i think it's hard to do in a high pressure environment when things are just so quick and uh, you know and things turn around so quickly and stuff and there's not always things that you agree on and you know uh you you know thinking that things could go in a different direction and and stuff but um i think i probably became more aware in terms of its importance when I moved on to the English Institute of Sport. Um, again, I think certainly that that time at Reading was very much fast paced learning. Um, and I probably you I probably understood it where I was involved in it and how I sort of developed in that area more once I left than when I was enduring it, you know, in that time of looking back and on the experiences and certain situations you're in and what you could have done better um and which direction you could have taken and then going right now i've got an opportunity to actually do that in a new environment with new athletes and new people and stuff like that and um quite early on in my time at the institute of sport or eis um i got an opportunity to do a, a practitioner development program which was an internal uh learning program um whereby you very much develop and study those soft skills um how to build relationships with the coaches with uh, other um, multidisciplinary team with the athletes um and you know ways of communicating with them and um building that trust and um and yeah actually just you know problem solving listening you know what what what's the what's the performance question that we're trying to answer here you know um um is it this or is it something else and really digging down around your understanding at a deeper level um and being able to sort of clinically reason critically think you know um and um that by doing that equally helps with your own self-reflection and then 
putting it into your own technical skills as a therapist as to how you can develop those uh, and apply those more effectively really so i think the 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 time at reading gave me a, the a, a volume of, of of information in that space but the eis gave me the framework to be able to put it into boxes and to be able to link it together and understand it a bit better i think mm. yeah and how did that role at eis come about then um it was um it was something i applied for really i think that you know my time at reading the the, the, the um, things were changing um steve copperwood decided not to stay on um and i think the club had gone in a direction of needing to cut costs a little bit and my role sort of went from a full-time to a self-employed part-time almost sort of where it was hours wise to when i started um and um I felt if I just stuck with that and, and private practice, my development might sort of stall a little bit. And I probably felt like I needed a new challenge as well. Um, and it was actually a, an advertised position for a part time soft tissue therapist that was working with uh, down in Bath at one of their performance centers um, uh, in a multi sport role. So at the time they had British Swimming had one of its high performance centers down there. Um, modern pentathlon were based there. Um, Bath Uni had a really strong netball setup, of which many of their players played for England. So there was access to to those players, um, and there was um, the British Athletics had their sort of sprint hurdle set up there as well under Malcolm Arnold. So it was just exposure to lots of different sports, um, different performance setups, and that. And again, it was just it was just a really, really exciting time because this was 2009, just come off the back of a, 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 a successful Olympic Games in Beijing in 2008. We obviously had London on the horizon in 2012. So, you know, it was an exciting push towards really making it a successful Games. And so coming on board at that time was was exciting really um, and uh, I got to work mainly with British Swimming a lot of my hours was focused towards them um, which included being able to support them on a, a national level so I, I got some trips in with British Swimming to European Championships uh, um, uh, went to the Commonwealth Games in 2010 to support Team England uh, and the swimming set up there um, as well as um, you know some other sort of smaller events and things really um and um and that was really again another another learning ex experience you know having only really sort of done the uh domestic stuff with football and, and that actually going away for two three weeks you know in a training camp and then a competition and the intensity of doing that you know it was an extended version of i guess a pre-season camp with with football and that but with a with competition at the end of it so um you were very much at the business end of something rather than at the beginning which you very much were with a pre-season tour so so yeah and it's long hours swimming's not a um you know uh done in a couple of hours competition you know you've got heats in the morning back for finals in the afternoon you know you're there before the swimmers arrive you know you're there till the last one goes and then you're back to the hotel your lunch see a few athletes that might be performing that afternoon or have trained have performed that morning and not race until the next day so you're then back down the pool for the afternoon meet and, the, and then you're back at the hotel and you 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 very rarely see anyone at the hotel in the evenings because you, you're not back until sort of nine o'clock half past nine sometimes um so you get all the work done at the pool and then repeat the next day and that that's sort of a cycle really for for anything between sort of five and seven days really depending on how long the competition is um so uh so yeah it's quite a long a long shift uh when you when you look at it like that so uh um, mm. but i really enjoyed it you know great group of people some really top athletes uh at the time um still still competing i think most have retired now actually um and um but um it was it was great access to a a completely different sport really so um, most of the swimming I did in football was when the players couldn't walk or couldn't run. So, you know, it was a uh, pool rehab more than anything. So what? how did that differ then for, for you in terms of your enjoyment and just the dynamic of going from a football club? And I can imagine like, you know, the, the, 
the kind of you're seeing the same guys every day you've got the real dressing room mentality through to being in swimming but also the multi-sport how did you find that change so i think the first thing was the you know that that, that was different and probably aligned you know more with the way i feel comfortable working was in football very much it's you know it can be a bit reactive and probably again looking back at my time at reading um you don't know what you don't know and i and i was very much kind of i guess reactive in terms of working with the players it would be when they come into the treatment room, Andy, can I see for this? Can I see for that? And you just manage the the players around the time that you've got either before training or after training, you know, and once I moved into the English Institute of Sport and equally those players, you know, they're there full time. So they can access you when they want, how, how as many times as they went over the course of the week, you know, you're employed by the club to provide that service. Now, the English Institute of Sport is very different because it is a government funded setup. So um, UK sport very much dictate um, where the funding goes into certain sports. So the, the EIS is basically a, sub, a subcontractor really to governing bodies of sport. And um, depending on how the sport wants their performance set up to look like they will invest in certain services of which the EIS would provide so a smaller funded sport might only be able to afford a part-time doctor and a part-time physio your British rowings your British cycling British swimming you'll have doctor physios soft tissue therapists biomechanists um, strength and conditioning coaches either part-time or full-time and stuff so um, it's very much determined by funding so when that then filters down to the athletes it's then if you've only got 0.2 equivalent of soft tissue that you're providing to british swimming then you cannot you can't see the whole squad in 0.2 hours essentially so you've then got so it then becomes tiered so your podium athletes which are the ones that are earmarked to potentially medal at the next olympic games um have um uh more priority than those that are in the development level now if then a couple of athletes go away on a camp you know then that frees up more time for those athletes you know that might not get so much access during the week and stuff so it was all done on a booking system you know and athletes would book in um for around their training for either a half an hour or an hour depending on what they were allowed to have um, so again, the, the challenges that you're up against is very much bang for buck. You know, I've only got this much time with this athlete this week. Where are they now and where do they need to be? Um, and how can I most effectively get them there? You know, and working closely with the physio in terms of how can you work together to achieve that together and not almost see it as a massage goal and a physio goal. You know, it's actually, well, if I do look after this, then you can look after that. Um, and what I certainly, I think, like uh, tried to evolve, particularly with the swimming, was where was it possible with some athletes to actually uh, um, do, if you want, like a brick session? So they'd see me for half an hour for some soft tissue work, optimize movement literacy and their capability of going into certain positions and stuff. And then the physio would go and load them effectively, or the strength and conditioning would go and load them effectively. So you're almost preparing them for what they're going to do versus just treating them based on what they've asked for, you know, and that's where there's that kind of balance of what you need in order to go and swim well. Uh, but this is what I also think you need based on what we're working towards and stuff. So it's a, it's about negotiation and compromise. And, you know, it's not seeing that, um, you know, you're, you're actually athlete centered approach they're they're part of their own treatment process and you're having those conversations with them um and being led by that and not not just on right can you rub this or this is feeling tight and you know actually digging down into is there something more going on and stuff so um so yeah again it probably shifted my thinking a lot more during that time um towards that proactive approach and actually having KPIs to work towards and using the screening information that we used to do um, at the start of the year to to work on things um, in a periodized way, if you will, you know, if there's certain 
movement patterns that they they find difficult in the gym, which prevents them from loading more safely, then how can we help improve that? You know, and so it became working a lot more closely with the other facets of support with strength and conditioning in particular with physiotherapy um with you know biomechanics or whatever so um i sort of learned to kind of appreciate uh the multidisciplinary team in a slightly different way i think and how we probably could work a lot more closer together as opposed to in silos mm, yeah no i can i can imagine it's quite complicated i've always tried to get my head around how EAS works and, yeah you know at team GB and so on so how long were you at EAS for uh I left in 2016 so I spent probably uh up until just after the London Olympics um so I'd gone to the London as part of team GB um again to support British swimming um which was you know a phenomenal experience um I think topped off really with the fact that one of the athletes that that I was working with quite closely in the lead up to the games in in Bath, I actually went with him to be able to work with him at the games, uh, which resulted in him uh, getting a silver medal in uh, as well. So you know it was um, it was uh, it was really nice to kind of go through that whole journey to the final and with a medal at the end of it. And you know I think as a as a team you know, that, uh, what, that cohesiveness that we had and the, the trust uh, the athletes had of us, you know, w that was just sort of made it all worthwhile, you know, and, um, you know, so that was, that was fantastic. And then, and then an opportunity came up with another sport um, with British canoeing. Um, so living in Newbury, the commuter bath was an hour or so um, for, what invariably would be a four hour shift to then drive an hour home from Bisham Abbey was in the other direction, you know, a little bit closer. So, um, so I took on a, a part-time role with British canoeing for a brief period of time. I was sort of going one day West, one day East. Uh, so I was almost close to, I wouldn't say full time, but I was sort of 20 plus hours with the IS um, working across multiple different sports at two different high performance centers, which, you know, logistically brings its its challenges as well. Um, and um, so I worked with, with them until an opportunity came up to work with British Rowing. And I migrated really permanently to Bisham Abbey from from uh, from Bath then to work sort of with British canoeing and British rowing, um, and uh, and I, I stayed with them then uh, in the lead up to the Rio Olympics from probably about 2013 14 I think it was. Um, didn't get to go to Rio. Um, you don't get as much accreditation to travel to an away Olympic Games as you do for a home game. So. British swimming were a lot smaller in terms of its support staff. Um, and at that time, they were, British swimming had, had changed um, its approach to uh, competition. So they weren't taking soft tissue therapy with them to the games either. Um, British rowing didn't really have the accreditation to do that either. So most of my work was done up until when they went off, you know, to, to Rio and to their respective camps, really. Um, but I had the opportunity to work with disability sports during that time as well. So with adaptive rowing, um, <clears throat> with disability, uh, with um, uh, the para athletes as well, um, a, a British athlete, athletics and stuff. So again, different challenges, different ways of working, um, learn a lot about the human body and what it's capable of and not, you know, and not through certain conditions and things. So um, that was great. And then um, I was probably from about 2015, I was, I don't know, I was kind of getting itchy feet to get back into football, if I'm honest. Um, and I pursued a number of, you know, uh, positions that came up and for one reason, reason or another didn't, didn't materialize or didn't work out. Um, and, and then uh, I suddenly got a, a message from Rich Buchanan at uh, Swansea City, who, was looking at changing things up um, within the sports science and medical department at Swansea City. And would I be interested in coming in and 
taking on a sort of a lead role in the, uh, as a soft tissue therapist and I'd sort of come off the back of moving into a technical lead role at the EIS so I was um, looking after soft tissue therapy across the whole of the EIS across all its sites uh, as a technical lead uh, before I left um, which was great because I worked quite closely then with Funnily enough, many of the people you've already interviewed, um, Lee Harrington and, um, you know, uh, Simon Spencer, who's now works closely with the FA, he's now head of um, a head of physiotherapy at the EIS. Um, um, who else have I worked with? Um, uh, Ian Gatt as well, who's now uh, with British Boxing. He was um, crossed over um, into the technical lead stuff for a bit when I was there. Uh, and Ian Horsley. Um, so, you know, great people to work with, great people to learn from. And, you know, it was learning a lot about the leadership and development, really, and managing others, uh, you know, more so in that, um, which set me up nicely for a lead role at, at Swansea City. Um, where so I that technical last... lead role then, like what, how did that come about then? And like, what, how did, did you enjoy that? What, at, at the EIS? The EIS, yeah. Yeah, so it was... Um, Initially, it was um, there was someone in the role when I came on board um, who left the IS, went into uh, I think she went on maternity leave and then decided not to return. And myself and uh, a, another soft tissue therapist who we both worked together at Swimming, we took on a dual role for it where she'd sort of she was based up in Loughborough. So she'd look after kind of like that anywhere north of Birmingham. And then I'd look after anything south of Birmingham, really. Um, and um, We'd work closely with the operation managers and the, I guess, the clinical and leads that were based at each of the IS sites when it came to recruitment and um, and just in terms of developing soft skills and technical skills. And, you know, we had our own sort of breakouts at the annual conferences and things that was very soft tissue therapy specific. And I think it just it evolved. We were probably the two that, that covered the most amount of hours with the EIS and were both in an employed position rather than a contract position. So it was just a natural progression. I think we were both asked by the um, head of physio at the time if it was something of interest. And it was certainly something that I was very much interested in and in an area that I wanted to kind of uh, move into and develop in terms of leadership skills and management and stuff. So, so yeah. And then, um, so I took on that. Um, a colleague decided to step down from that role probably a year outside of me leaving maybe 18 months um so then i was looking after it solely um for that time and then the, say the opportunity to finally sort of go back into football came about and um and that's sort of when i made the decision to take what i'd sort of learned and, and consolidated through my time at the is and thought what's football now operating like you know can we go in and, you know, use some of that experience of how other sports work to apply it into, into Swansea, really? Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I got my, my wish to sort of get back into football, but it, um, it brought its own challenges. It was, it was, it was good and good and bad in many different ways. Um, I think it was all Swansea at the time were on its descendancy in terms of, performances on the pitch they've gone through a number of managerial changes which um and I guess their way of playing started to kind of drift a little bit you know they were always known I think as Swans alone because of the passing ability that they uh, that they had um that got them to the Premier League and then uh you know the the challenges of staying there kind of shifted a bit and um uh I think I had including caretaker managers I worked under seven managers into an, in just over two seasons um which um you know seven pre-seasons if you will you know different styles all all managers with different philosophies different approaches you know so you know you usually see a, a spike in injuries when a new manager comes in because they want them to train in a different way and play in a different way and um so it was uh I think as a medical department, navigating navigating through that period was quite challenging. Um, um, I mean, it was good. Again, you learn a lot about yourself, but um, I was equally, I, I still lived in Newbury. So we're talking about two and a half 
hour drive to the training ground. Um, I was staying over a couple of times a week to break it up, but um, most of the time I was then sort of commuting. Um, so it was a, yeah, half five leave for an eight o'clock meeting. And then, you know, you'd finish off about three, half three for another two and a half hour drive to get home. And um, it was during that period that my wife and I had our first child as well. So, you know, a few sleepless nights and then driving to Swansea <laughs> meant a few uh, a few cheeky stop offs at services for a half an hour power nap before carrying on. Um, but, um, you know, I think, it, yeah, it, it's um, there, was a, there was a lot of good things that happened, you know, um, during that time. But um, it, it, as a, there was, you know, I didn't always get on with everyone that I worked with at the time. I think I came up against some challenges with a colleague who 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 felt I think that um me coming in took on what they should have naturally taken on and progressed to and I think there was a bit of ill feeling about that and it took a while to work through that you know we were fine by the end and stuff but um you know it was um I get it was difficult and because I think I was uh, I was new to back into football football changed a lot um so I was still finding my feet in terms of what I thought could work and what not obviously we had the you know the on the football side there was a lot of changes with management with that brings about a degree of uncertainty and feeling vulnerable and and I think I had certainly that I then started to question was I good enough to do that role you know um you know would the other person be better doing it you know and you start to kind of I don't know, believe things that aren't really there or see things that really uh, are there. And, um, you know, I guess a bit of that imposter syndrome sort of creeps in. And um, and you when you spend a lot of time in the car on your own, inside your own head, you know, it kind of manifests itself a lot. And, um, you know, I had some sort of dark times during that period, you know, but equally some, you know, enjoyable times. And, you know, met, you know, Swansea's a you know, great city, great people, um and the people that majority of them worked at the club were swansea born and bred you know it was their passion really the club and um and you were great people to work with you know but when there's pressures of hovering around the relegation zone and what that brings you know it also it affects people's behaviors and you know including your own and um you know it became sort of really difficult uh towards the end and uh and I think really with the birth of, of our first child, it, it really reinforced the decision for me that I needed to be closer to home. And uh, um, and my wife was going back to work full time as well. So um, it was really the decision to kind of then step away from football. And, and I guess realise that, you know, with a young family and a wife that's sort of... Um, you know, very driven and in a senior role that you can, you, it's hard for both to do that, you know, and, and particularly in an environment like football where it's all consuming, you know, you don't know what you're doing, you know, um, sometimes day to day, depending on the manager, but sometimes week to week, you know, the good ones, you knew what you're doing month by month and it didn't really flex too much. The ones under a lot of pressure that didn't really plan, you know, you you'd get a day off when you didn't need it and you'd get it taken away when you needed it. So, you know, it was, um, you know, and then you're upsetting the family because you've got to go in and you can't go and do something. So it was, it was just too volatile to kind of, to do that living as far away as I did with the young family and, and it was, you know, without it affecting the relationships that you have with, with friends and family. So, so I made the decision to, to step away and to just go into private practice for a year and just reflect a bit in terms of where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do now. And, um, and I was sort of in a, in a physio clinic, um, close to home. Um, and, um, that's what's where I spent sort of 12 months sort of trying to build up my own sort of practice again, but. I don't think I ever really dealt with the the challenges and the, sort of the the mental challenges that I had in my time at Swansea. Um, I probably just thought they'd go away because I'd changed the circumstances and changed the environment. And um, I equally spent as much time on my own. I felt I'd lost my identity. You know, you've gone through a period of being Andy who works in Olympic Games, Andy who works with sports, Andy who works in football to Andy. 
Uh, and I think um, it's a big thing in sport where you've got clinicians, practitioners that that's all they've known and that's where they've operated for a long time, that step away and go into private practice is that the identity you associate yourself with um, and equally the, the challenges that you have um, in those environments um, are hard to deal with. Um, and um, so, yeah, it was a, it was a, a, a difficult period really um, because I still felt like I had stuff to offer in terms of working in sport. And I just didn't really see where that might happen. Uh, I did some contract work with the IS for a period of time with hockey and rowing again, which was nice to go back uh, with Surrey Cricket Club uh, as well. Um, and with Man City Women's Football Club. So that kind of almost filled a need to still be involved in that. But when you were working on my own as a sole practitioner, in private practice was difficult because I'd only ever really worked in teams and I saw the benefit of having that team around you and where to refer to and and and, and who to look after certain aspects of, of, of where you need you to take uh, people to and when you then don't have that and you're kind of like every role but not necessarily being an expert in every role it's it's a it's a it's a hard process to kind of build those relationships up in where you've got to then send patients to another clinic or to you know someone that's not under the same roof as you and stuff so um you're almost a, a separate business under the roof of another business um so uh so yeah it was it was it, it was a difficult time from honest andy yeah it really was and so at that point then did you what, what were you what were you ideally wanting to do you were sort of dipping into sport here and there but did you yeah. uh, reflect on the profession in general or do you know you wanted to stay in it no i think i knew i knew i wanted to stay in it i think it brought its financial challenges at home in terms of could i stay in it did i need to go off and look at something else and i certainly came very close to to doing that um based on my situation that i was in at the time and stuff but you know the opportunities to come into foot to sport a few and far between and as we know the the breadth of of people out there looking to get into it has increased so much you know making that sort of funnel a lot smaller really and stuff um regardless of your you know your experience and things and i think i just knew that i needed stability um i needed to feel valued by others as um i needed to be around others, um, to work with, to learn from, to educate. Um, and, um, and it didn't matter that it, whether it was sport or not, I just knew that I needed those things around me for my own mental health, I guess. Um, and, um, that's when an opportunity with pure sports medicine came up. Um, and it was, as a head of soft tissue therapy which i thought was perfect because it allows me to take my leadership experience and to continue to to grow that i knew you know you're only really leading yourself when you're on your own um and that wasn't enough for me um so uh so yeah i took on a role i think it's january 2020 i started with pure sports medicine um I knew it was back in the commuting game again, um, but um, it, 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 we made it work. And um, unbeknownst to all of us, you know, we had sort of COVID around the corner in a little less than sort of two months from starting a new job, which then, I mean, it was a godsend because, you know, uh, I was furloughed, you know, I got support from, from Pure Sports Medicine, which was fantastic. And um, it meant that I was full-time dad for about, you know, two, two to three months and stuff before gradually going back part-time and then back to a full-time position. But the landscape, as with any business, was very different post-COVID than it was pre-COVID. And, you know, I was having to work hard on recruitment, rebuilding a team that had kind of decimated a bit. Um, we had, uh, what being in London, it was sort of a bit of a multicultural uh, soft tissue team. So we had practitioners that went back to their respective countries during COVID and didn't return. So 
you know, it was having to kind of build build a, a, a soft tissue service back up again, but equally then moving it forwards beyond where it was when, when COVID hit, which brought about its, its own challenges, um, building a patient list back up as well. Um, but it was great because I think being in London where it's so fast paced and things operate so differently to like out here in Reading and uh, some of the you know the the home counties i guess and uh, and further uh, further afield is that um your understanding of what makes private practice work particularly for an organization like pure was really valuable you know you're, you're not just a healthcare clinic now you're an organization with seven clinics across you know the the district of london you know um 200 odd employees you know you've got a board you've got an operations team you've got a marketing team you know uh, and you know when you're in a, a clinic either one or two you don't really have all of that around you and stuff so it was and it, it and obviously it's very different from working in sport even though you might still see athletes and that through um through treating and stuff but it was good to learn all of the i guess the business aspect of that and you know the politics sometimes that come with that um but it was um um it was really valuable really valuable um and in the end it was it was a case of you know um uh, not necessarily needing a new challenge i think i mean my time with pure came to an end because of um personal reasons um needing to be closer to home you know the commute on top of an eight hour day is a lot when you've got a young family as well and you know um a wife that's equally working the same sort of hours and, and things and i think there just needed to be a a, a bit of a shift to find that balance um and stuff and so um and so yeah coming full circle here i am at one physiotherapy and you know still um still hungry to learn more and develop and i think i've certainly i haven't ever closed i don't think you'll ever close the door on on working in sport but i think it's very much about timing um that's right for you. It's important to know that if you're doing it, you're doing it for the right reasons and not just to get back into it. And um, for me at the moment, private practice works. Um, uh, I've, I've got an interest in wanting to develop in other areas, um, still in, in a leadership and, and a management role, but also more on the health side of stuff uh rather than the performance side of stuff um so i'm studying to add oncology to uh to my skill sets uh i've recently done a scar work course as well and which i find fascinating so you know i'm now treating patients that are you know orthopedic scars post-op um you know, C-section scars, you know, uh, post-cancer surgery scars and stuff like that as well, which is just, it's so interesting, you know, the impact that it has on people emotionally um, as well as physically and, um, and and sort of what you can give back in terms of quality of life from treating that stuff, you know, from patients that can't touch a scar, can't look at a scar because of trauma that's related to it and the impact that it has on them mentally to being able to then have a relationship with it you know before you've even changed anything physically with the scar it's just getting them to have a better relationship with it and stuff you know so you it's very much learning about um your ability to absorb people's trauma and being able to to talk to them and you know it's the, the therapy is very much about you know your language and your narrative as much as it is about what you do when you put your hands on people as well so uh, it's just really interesting really interesting and opens open up ways of you know of, 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 of treating in a different coming at it from a different filter I guess but but still being able to make change and become effective with with those you work with and stuff so so yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting twenty years of uh, of practice, really. That uh, hopefully there's still more to come. So definitely, yeah. The scar scar therapy that seems to be, from from my knowledge, certainly over the last maybe two or three years, it really seems to be there's more mm. education out there. We work with some great people mm. in, in that area, whether it's in that the the women's health. Yeah. Um, post-op orthopedics burns we do a lot in, in the burns yeah. area the K casey piper foundation dance fund 
and it's it's really interesting isn't it and like you say that the mental side of it is is really critical depending on um where it's come from certainly the women's health and some of the more traumatic things as well mm. what made you want to get into that um i think a number a number of things really particularly on the oncology side um my without going into it too much you know my father-in-law unfortunately passed away you know last year um through cancer um and we were very close uh, and he um and over recent years you know i think when you, you get to a certain age where you know um it becomes a bit more prevalent within you know friendship groups and family groups and stuff and you know i think we've been sort of affected by it quite a bit and you know i i've sort of I guess moved into that direction and I, I I had an interest in going down that route when I was at pure sports medicine and I was very much um ch uh championing um the the need to kind of get into that into the private health space you know offering oncology rehab oncology support just because of seeing how overwhelmed the NHS system is and that but you know, when it's a matter of life and death, people can't wait, you know, and they are, you know, if they know that they can go and receive care for, you know, management of symptoms to do with treatment, um, you know, it, it's, you know, the massage and the soft tissue therapy is, is not going to change the outcome. But if you can help them through that journey, less with less pain and less complications and equally, just give the carers of those people going through it some space and some time to just go and have on their own because it's you know having seen my mother-in-law go through it it's all consuming you know and sometimes the people just value some of their own time you know and being able to spend an hour with someone to work with that you know is you're actually you're treating two people at once essentially um you know so so yeah, there's um, there's a lot to kind of learn in that that space. Of of course, it's huge, you know, but it's it's interesting to go down. And I think, you know, my approach has changed so much over the years. In that, you know, um, I very much started out on with a thought process of right, I'm treating the quad, I'm treating the hamstring, I'm treating the knee. Uh, it's a very location based approach to treatment. When in reality you know we're a complex system you know and there's there should be a systems-based thinking to your treatment um and with any complex systems it's um it's a, a a multiple of variables that lead to an outcome and how they interconnect and how they relate you know and that you know a blood flow problem is equally a, lack, a lymphatic problem which is equally an immune system problem so you know you're then starting to think about how you can influence different systems to move things in the right direction um as opposed to just seeing something as a ankle problem or a knee problem um you know and uh, and you 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 can you you don't have to treat an area to have a positive effect on it you know you can treat away from that and influence the systems you know, and the importance of breath work within the use of your treatments and things like that as well. And something the patient can be doing actively and focusing on while you're applying the hands on stuff. You know, people forget the skin is the largest organ of the body. Right. And so it's communication with the brain and the rest of the body. You know, it's, um, you know, I think to I guess, it, you know, to sort of summarize it, you know, you 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 listen with your hands and you you know and communicate with your hands um so uh, if you're not if you're not applying that as part of a rehab process whether it's you know I'm not saying it has to be one person it could be multiple different people that's that's using that skill um to to sort of harness an understanding of the direction that patient or the athlete needs to go in then you're missing you're missing a huge component of that um and you know 20 years of putting hands on people you kind of develop you know i guess a uh a, a skill to kind of work out what's not right what's right you know um no, by by no means at 20 years do you have all the answers and stuff but you certainly know which rabbit holes to go down and which ones not to um and you know i think my my advice for anyone in sports massage and soft tissue therapy is just 
remain curious. You know, there's a lot of stuff that research is now showing that we've, we've not known before. So, yeah, um, you know, it was only five years ago we, we realised that the brain has its own lymphatic system, which is just crazy, you know. So if it's got its own, then we know the brain's important, right? You know, so look after it. Um, and, you know, I think, so be curious, what can you affect um and um and and question everything and and uh explore within your profession outside of your profession you know what things can you bring in that could that, that makes sense and that you can adopt and you can apply really so no great well that's a good good uh, good note to finish on be curious i like it mm. so andy no thank you very much for your time on that really appreciate your honesty and uh, really interesting 20 years and look forward to seeing seeing what happens over the next period of time as well brilliant thanks ever so much andy for your time um i really enjoyed it it's, it's nice to kind of share share your story now and again so uh so thank you for that opportunity no problem cheers andy see you soon thanks very much thank you thanks bye-bye